You can call him a grandpa. I just hit in there. And uh, hey, you know what I just realized? It's your birthday tomorrow, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Aww. Happy birthday to you. It's a big Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear listener. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How old are That's you going to be? That's my first birthday greeting. <laughs> How old are you going to be? Uh, old enough to know better, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the big 7 0 tomorrow. Wow. And listen, it's it's the new 60 or 50 at least, so we're okay. The class is yours, Commissioner. Thank you, thank you. It, it's a joy to uh, be with you, and it's amazing the technology that provides this opportunity. I just wish I were uh, sitting with you in right in the class, but that's not possible. Uh, I commend the college for having this course. Important to understand uh, the life that uh, we live in, the, the, the time that we live in, and the people that we will be, you will be meeting and ministering to and with uh, in the years ahead. I know that you've already had uh, a rabbi come and uh, you, uh, speak to you. I wish I could have been in that class. I think you all have a copy of my book, Celebrate the Feast of the Lord, and you'll see in the middle section there, I think it's on the third full page, the third full page of pictures, a picture of uh, Rabbi Judah Kogan, who um, his congregation for a year and a half used our training college in New York for their worship on Saturday and for the class, their classes on Thursday. So it was a unique experience. And I, uh, we became good friends. And I asked uh, Judah if he would proof the book. And he did that. He, I said, I think we know, we know each other well enough. We, we know we'll come to different conclusions about Jesus. <laughs> But uh, I wanted to make sure that everything was accurate uh, about the Jewish culture. And I'm glad that you had a chance to uh, talk to the rabbi, because it's very important to not put a spin on the feasts, for example, or anything to do with Judaism, but to look at it objectively, remembering that Jesus was not only a Jew, but he was an observant Jew. And we're going to look at that we're going to look at an overview of the seven feasts in light of uh, Jesus and his life uh, on earth. Now, you, you all have your uh, laptops, and you have the PowerPoint up. Is, are you looking at the front page, for the first screen, which just says College for Officer Training, right? Now, if you move that, I'll, say, I'll tell you when to click. I wish I could click it there yet, but move uh, to the to the next page, which which just is se session one, two, and three, which we can't do, of course. So just go by that, and then the next one says the feast of the, the Lord, a study from Leviticus twenty three. Okay, and you have your notes in front of you. Now I I give out notes. Uh, because I know that if you're like me, when I'm in a lecture, I get writing so fast that I don't listen. And I want to make sure that you listen and that you, you understand. So most of the notes are there, but there are some fill in the blanks simply to keep you awake. You, you don't want, uh, I, I've asked uh, Billy to give extra credit to anyone who fills in every page okay now i'm only kidding of course but uh, this is this is so you'll have the notes and that you can keep uh track of uh, where we're going now we're going to look at the feast of the lord uh from leviticus 23 and uh this is the feast of the lord in hebrew say it with me i'll say it and then you say hak mo de yahweh 
Of course, this is the same verse that's repeated in uh, Peter in the New Testament. It's a quote from the Old Testament. Be holy. For no other reason, by the way, be holy because I am holy. Now listen to the contents uh, of uh, the book. The book of Leviticus, now let me move your, uh, move your, one more slide, explicit instruction. The book of Leviticus contains an explicit instructions for, and then you can click down for each of these. Number one, the offering of sacrifices. Two, resolving everyday problems. Third, instructions on cleanliness. Reminds me of what William Booth did in the early army. He, he sent out instructions on resolving everyday problems and, and cleanliness. This is what God is doing. These are practical considerations. And then number four, observing Israel's special holidays, the feasts of the Lord. Now a couple fill-ins here also. Of the 27 chapters in Leviticus, two concern Israel's sacred calendar, chapters 23 and 25. Those are, and we're going to look at chapter 23. Before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Orthodox Jew must comply with each meticulous detail of Leviticus 23. It's important for us to understand this because then we're going to see uh, the picture of Jesus when he made major pronouncements and to, to see the, the, the big picture in Leviticus 23. It had meticulous details for celebrating the feast. For example, there could be no error in co commemorating the feasts. One mistake in the celebration of the Day of Atonement, for example, would result in banishment from the nation. God was very serious about the feasts in order to teach the people and teach us. This is part of our heritage, too. Now the consequences. Chapter 23 is one of the most fascinating and instructive chapters in the Bible. In a brief 44 verses, Jehovah, God, introduces the seven annual sacred feasts of the Lord. At first reading, it appears to be a simple list of Israel's major holidays. The further study, which we're doing now, of the entire Bible places this portion in perspective. This chapter is more than a list of holidays. It is the centerpiece of Israel's holy days. Now what's the connection? The connection between the feasts in the Old Testament and Christians today the sacred calendar is precious to us also. We don't observe the feasts, neither do we have to. We're not Jewish, so I'm not advocating, no one's advocating that we should uh, follow the, the feasts and uh, perform them annually as did the Jews, but we must learn from them. This sacred calendar is precious to us, to those who and I have it on the next screen. Turn your, turn your screen. Those who have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. You remember that Jesus uh, said, I have not come to, I, I have come, yes, I, I have come to fulfill the law. Christ is a fulfillment of what we're going to be studying. When we found him, we discovered that the Old and New Testament are not two books. They are a unity. And I encourage you, cadets, when you plan your preaching calendar in your ministry, balance it between 
the Old Testament and the New Testament. I have a friend who always refers to the Old Testament as the Older Testament. Because the word old itself uh, connotes something that's uh, passé, that, that, that's been supplanted. But Jesus said, I, I have not come to destroy the law. What we're studying is not destroyed. I have not come to destroy the law, but fulfill it. So we see it in new perspective. I like calling it the Older Testament. We have a question. Yes, yes, Bill. God, it's, uh, Dave, David, Dave. Sorry. Hi, David. Hello, uh, Commissioner. I had a question about uh, the, the covenants. In, in speaking uh, of a new covenant in uh, Hebrews, the writer says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. I'd just like to know, uh, have some of your insights about how that verse um, kind of plays into what you just described about the older testament, as opposed to calling it the Old Testament. It's, it's a matter of, uh, of degree. Now, the writer of the Hebrews is uh, trying to make a very important point, and that is that Jesus has come, the new covenant, uh, is a new relationship with Christ, it, 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 with God. It's uh, like Paul was saying, uh, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the point that the writer was making and in writing we, we often have to emphasize a point to maybe even overemphasize a point to 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 make it clear so clearly jesus has fulfilled the law and we are in a new covenant the whole word new means replacing new covenant jesus however again reminds us, and we must listen to Jesus' words, I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So, when you destroy something, what replaces it may have nothing to do with what you've destroyed. You've destroyed it, and something brand new is happening. In fact, that's one of the problems when we, we just throw away the past, start something new. What the Bible is saying, when you read it in its entirety, is that the Older Testament, this is not a destruction of the law, it is the fulfillment of the law. It's a big, big difference. And I think Christians often misunderstand that. We look at Judaism and the other religions of the world, but especially Judaism, because that's part of our culture, as a passé that they're blind, they don't see. But it's, it's what they don't see is the fulfillment of what they're doing. So we, we, we don't want to destroy. And Jesus said, I don't want to destroy, I want to fulfill the law. It, it, does that help? Yes, that helps, thank you. No, thanks for the, thanks for the very good question, because that's what uh, hermeneutics is all about. The study of scripture is all about not taking scripture little portions of it on its own, but putting it into context and trying to understand. Because we, we're we locked into this thing we call language and words. So often we fight about words when and miss the deeper understanding of the concept, you know? Yes. Okay. The old, Older and the New Testament are a unity. They are the Holy Scriptures. Now let's look at Jesus' life. If you push down for the next uh, slide. Jesus participated in Jewish rituals from his early days. Number one, Mary and Joseph presented six-week-old son, Yeshua, in the temple. He was their firstborn. And the law required that he, that he had to be taken to the priests to be redeemed. That's Luke 2, 22 to 38. You have the, the story there. So Mary and Joseph fulfilled the law. Six weeks after Jesus was born, they had to go for two reasons. To pay the temple tax. <laughs> tax is always the first thing. They had to pay the temple tax to exempt him from military service, that is Jewish military service. So they had to pay a tax. Secondly, for Mary's purification. 
And of course, this is where Mary and Joseph come up the temple steps and they come on to the court of the Gentiles. And who do they see? A very old man named Simeon, who had been waiting, waiting. Here's Mary, probably about 16 years old, Joseph maybe 19, young teenagers, for in today's uh, perspective. And, she, and Mary is holding a six-week-old baby. And this old man, you know, I picture him with a long beard and spittle coming down his beard. He's, he's very old, you see. But God said, you're not going to die until you see the sign. And he looked across and he saw Jesus. It was a blue blanket, so he knew it was a boy. <laughs> and he went over and he looked into Mary's face and he said give me the child and Mary presented him I'm sure he looked at Joseph she looked at Joseph and said Should I? don't drop the baby don't drop the baby and Simeon held him up and said my eyes have seen thy salvation Jesus fulfilled the law there, you see. Right from the beginning, Jesus fulfilled every requirement of the law. Secondly, on your screen, Jesus was raised in a devout, God-fearing home. Luke notes that, quote, his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover, Luke 2.41. And in fact, he probably went three times a year. There were three of the seven feasts that all males within I would, uh, a two days journey, 15, 20 miles, had to attend. And that was Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So without question, Jesus at least went three times a year to Jerusalem, walked from Nazareth which is even more than a two-day journey. But again, that was the, the, the Jews, if they could make it, would make it to Jerusalem for those three occasions. So every year he does this. Number three. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus taught that his mission was not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And again, Matthew 5.17. I am come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And this is what we're focusing on now. Jesus' participation in the ritual. Go to the next two slides. He often chose the national festivals as settings to make astonishing statements about himself. Go down one on your slide. His father, the next one. His relationship to the Word of God and the world he came to save. So that's what we're looking for here. A backdrop from the fe of the feasts. Jesus makes astonishing statements about himself, about his Father, his relationship to the Word of God and to the world he came to save. Now this is, I don't have a slide for this, but this is in your notes. In the Gospel of John alone, this is amazing, really. A surprising majority of the content is given to Jesus' ministry at the great feasts of Israel. Of the 879 verses in John's Gospel, 660 directly relate to events occurring just before, during, or immediately following one of the feasts. So the backdrop of John's Gospel, 75% of John's Gospel has a feast as the backdrop. So these, are, these are very important events, and Jesus is using them to teach about himself and his Father and his relationship to the Word of God. Back in your notes now. As we study the feasts, of the Lord outlined in Leviticus 23. 
we quickly realize that we cannot understand the New Testament without understanding the Old or Older Testament. And the converse is true, by the way. You can't really understand the Old Testament if you don't understand and experience the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the New Testament. We cannot begin to fathom the truths of the Older Testament until we accept the one who was revealed in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we, we re, I, I, this is a good verse to keep reiterating. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but I have come to fulfill them. Now the first three verses, by the way, it's very interesting because these are about seven uh, feasts. But actually, the major feast, the big ongoing feast, is every week. It's the Sabbath. And by the way, we Christians can learn from this. What, what's our Sabbath? Sometimes uh, Sunday is the busiest day, the hardest work day of the, of the, of the week for us. We can learn from this. It's, it's good, good thinking and discussion about it. Let's look at that uh, verse. And again, if you just click down twice, I think, after this, you'll see the scripture from uh, uh, Leviticus 23.3. There are six days. Let's read it together. There are six days. I don't have, I can't, i got to move my light here. There are six days when you may work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work. Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. Some uh, translations say, do no regular work. And uh, we, we have to remember that. Do no regular work. It's not like even on Sunday, it's not like we're we're just relaxing and taking it easy on the beach. We're, we're working, but do no regular work. This is a this is a, a Sabbath to the Lord. Back in your notes now. Prece preceding the catalog of appointed feast, God provides three verses of instruction for the most important day of the sacred calendar, Shabbat. Shabbat, S H A B. Well, it's on your ear now. Shabbat, the Sabbath. In keeping Shabbat, one discovers the foundation, the validity of all the feasts, because God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it He rested from all work of creating that He had done. Far from a day of gloom and dismay, by the way, Shabbat is a time of happiness and encouragement. It's a joyful time in a Jewish home. The Sabbath is God's precious gift to his people. It is, day, it is a day in which the creature thankfully recognizes the majesty and goodness of his creator. On this day, he acknowledges his special relationship to God, who is his peace. You know, in Israel, every morning, when you greet anybody, you say, Shalom. By the way, Jesus, that's what Jesus would say to you. If he came into the classroom today, he would say shalom. Shalom means more than just hello, good day. It means more than peace, really. It, it, it is that total relaxing peace in God. But on Saturday, you greet everyone with Shabbat Shalom. This is the special day. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath, in other words, the translation would be Sabbath peace. I wish we could take more time with this because, uh, again, I think uh, the fulfillment of this in our own unique lives in the Salvation Army in the 21st century, we have to wrestle with it. We really do. What is our peace? What is our Sabbath? God said once a week, we've, we've got to rest our minds. I see that hand. Leviticus and seeing the Sabbath it says a day of sacred assembly what did the 
the priests of the, the Levites do during this? Because obviously the sacred assembly had to be held by someone, and that's <coughs> us as clergy, what our role would be typically on the Sabbath. So what would that look like for us? Yes. Well, it, it, it changes throughout time. Because remember that Leviticus, written by Moses, is before they entered the promised land. This is a... So the fulfillment of what God says, the idea of what God wants us to do, has to be fit into the times in which we live. In Jesus' day, which is first century times, for, uh, second temple times in the first century, uh, they would go to the synagogue. And the reason was to be together, to join together, to have the families together. The synagogue was very much like a, a good course should be. <laughs> It was, the, it was the center of their um, community. So they, they would join together. And they would, I remember driving on a Saturday past Rabbi Kogan and his two girls who were walking to the synagogue. And I, of course, without thinking, I offered them a ride. And they can't ride. They have, they have to walk. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. In a Jewish home, Shabbat, is a special day and how can we make that special in in our in our lives that's the question i think we all have to and you were young uh uh new officers you, you have to start off with saying how am i going to celebrate this day of shabbat this day of uh of rest it's a very good question thank you for that now we're going to have a little, I want to have time for questions, so let's move on now to the sacred calendar and move your, move the slide one more. Oops, I'm going the wrong way, but you don't know that. Here we go. The sacred calendar. Here it is. Verses 4 through 43. There are seven appointed feasts of the Lord specified in, in uh, Leviticus 23. Now again, these aren't these aren't uh, options like choose one of the seven. You have to do them all. It's 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 tough being an observant Jew, by the way, because you have tough in the sense that you have to be careful to observe all of these. Now the first two, the first is Passover or Pesach. Say it with me, Pesach. Gotta get that in the back of your mouth too, Pesach. That's it. Uh, that's it. Verses four through five. This is uh, uh, this begins with the Exodus. Of course, it's a re reminder of uh, the redemption, God's redemption from Israel. When Jesus met with his disciples on what we call the Last Supper, it was the it was the Passover meal. It was a Seder meal, even called Seder back then. So the word Seder means uh, uh, ordered. So it was an ordered meal. And when Jesus took, the th you, you drink three cups of wine, or four cups of wine during the, the meal. And the third cup is the cup of redemption. And when we know, by the way, by but the scripture that it was the third cup that Jesus rose, uh, uh, he raised in front of the disciples, and he said, this is my blood. It was the cup of redemption. Why do we know it? Because it was, it's the first cup taken after the meal. And the scripture says, when they had eaten, Jesus raised the third, third cup, cup, the cup of redemption. This is, a, this is the cup. And by the way, that's why, let, let me finish. This is the cup that every, for a thousand years before Christ, every year of Jesus' life, he raised this cup, or his father raised the cup in their home, and they were thinking of a Messiah. They were thinking of redemption. So Jesus raises the cup, and he said, this is my blood. And he takes Yeah. And he said, 
this is my body. So again, Jesus, the Passover to say, Passover was all about me, the coming of redemption. By the way, we saw, we saw um, the Son of God yesterday, my wife and I. The, the movie? Great movie. Great movie. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Okay. The second is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Move down one. Feast, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now this, the, this uh, Passover is one day, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins the next day and lasts for a week. So Jesus died at Passover. He was buried at the, in the ground, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the next one is the Feast of First Fruits. And on the Feast of First Fruits, which is the Sunday, Easter Sunday, on that day, he rose from the dead. And as Paul said, he became the first fruit of them that sleep. So all that happened to Jesus in that fateful uh, week, Easter week, Holy week, Passion week, was in step, in lockstep with the Jewish feasts. He died at the Feast of Passover. He was in the ground, buried, for the Feast of Unleavened Bread that began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. That's how, how important those three are for us. Number four. Uh, just keep clicking ahead there. The Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot. Shavuot, say it with me. Shavuot. Shavuot means weeks. So it was seven weeks in a day after Pentecost. And it, it focuses on the law, the keeping of the law, the, on Sinai. And God used that uh, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples. They were thinking about the law. And Jesus is saying, I've made you free from the law. I fulfilled the law. <laughs> then we go to uh, Pentecost is usually May, June. Now we go to the Feast of Trumpets, which is Rosh Hashanah. Sometimes you hear it Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, but it's Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. This again is in usually September, late August, early September. Next is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is technically not a feast, but a fast. It's the one of the seven that is a fast, Yom Kippur. And finally, the great uh, feast. I got that down. Put, put two, click two down. Not technically a feast, but a fast. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. This is the great feast. By the way, like, for example, John's Gospel, chapter 7, through half of chapter 10, through 1032, all takes place, all takes place during the Feast of Tabernacles. It's during that feast that, that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It's also known as the, the festival of lights. During that feast, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Those three pronouncements of Jesus, of the eight, take place during that festival of tabernacles. Now, do you have the chart? Was the, was the chart passed out also? Yes. 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 The set of the Feast of Jehovah. Let's look at that. You ever have that? <clears throat> this is by Daniel Fuchs. And you will see the parallel. What each, uh, what happened during the first century with each, with Jesus' time, with each feast. So let's go left to right. Here are the actually seven feasts. You'll see only six circles. That's because Passover and unleavened bread uh, were early on morphed into one, morphed in the sense that they were always talked about as one. You have Passover and unleavened bread. Behold the Lamb of God. Jesus dies at that time. First fruits, he is risen. Pentecost, uh, 
the Holy Spirit to sense. And now we're in that four-month annual, four-month harvest period. It's the period of the church. But one day is coming when uh, we will, the trumpet will, pl will, will, will play and uh, Christ will come for his church. This is Rosh Hashanah. The, it's the meeting in the air, the rapture. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, Seven days of seven years of tribulation that are cut short in half, and then finally the Feast of Tabernacles, the reign of Christ. So you see that that, that picture there. Now keep that in mind as we go on, because I want to leave a few times for, uh, for comments here. Let's go on to the commentary. I'm not sure where I'm not moving here. Let's see. Dad? Here we go. Dad, you have six minutes here's, left. Here's, here's a commentary and observations. Six, what? Minutes, six minutes left. Before the okay, end. let's look at it. This is good. Here they are. Commentary and observations. All of the feasts, all of the holy days are frequently mentioned throughout the Old and New Testaments. That's an observation, okay? That's number two, actually. The first one is the feasts have historic symbolic and pr prophetic significance. So it's not just one. There's a historic reality, symbolic and prophetic significance. All of the holy days mentioned throughout the Old and New Testament. Number three, the New Testament clearly teaches that some of the feasts have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And number four, some of the prophecies are yet to be fulfilled. Now we go, to, go down to the, the last chart. Does everyone have these four written down? Yes. We all, all set? Yes. Okay. Let's go down. What has been fulfilled? Number one, verses 4 through 21 have been fulfilled. Push your uh, PowerPoint down to the next one. Fulfill, verses 4 through 21. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. And Pentecost. All of those have found fulfillment in Christ in the beginning of the church, Pentecost. Yet to be fulfilled, push a click it again, you will see verses 23 44 trumpets or the Rush uh, Hashanah, piece of trumpets, atonement, day of atonement, and tabernacles. Now, any comments or questions? Extra credit. <laughs> I hope, I hope got that uh, all of you have the opportunity sometime to participate in some of the feasts. Do we have one? Yeah, I got a, I got a question. So in the, uh, in the fast of, I guess you can't really call it a feast, in the fast of the Day of Atonement, um, yes. we, why is that one put into being not yet fulfilled? When, uh, when Christ's atonement has already been made? Well, that's a, that's a, a question that's, that's often uh, asked. It, it really is the, uh, the feast itself, the fast, is atonement for the whole world, and uh, the whole Jewish world, and it is uh, pictures the last days when all is atoned for. The atonement of Christ, of course, took place during Passover. There's no question about that. Jesus was uh, the one that at one minute brought us with God. He atoned for our sins. So that's used as a verb there, as a he, the atonement. He atoned for our sins. But the sixth feast, sixth feast uh, pictures the uh, final judgment. The final judgment. In fact, you you could put atonement dash uh, judgment uh, there. We have another question. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, I think it's just a very powerful statement, a very powerful presence that you know Christ came to fulfill the law, but it's represented in the structure as we need Christ involvement in all of these feasts or fasts. 
And it's just, I, I just think it's a real powerful way that it's, it's uh, constructed. So, thank you. Uh, absolutely, thank you for that uh, good observation. You know, I, I went to two Seder meals with uh, Rabbi Kogan. Rabbi Kogan and his wife, uh, Lisa, inv invited us. And it was just uh, a very wonderful experience. But to sit at the table and to go through the, the uh, Seder with a rabbi and a Jewish family, and then always thinking, you know, it's not the fulfillment of it. And the only way we can do it is through love, through love and through understanding. I hope each of you look for a good Jewish friend in life. <laughs> Because that, uh, the, they, we can learn a lot from them, and of course, they can see the Lord uh, in us. By the way, there, did you know 32% of the world is Christian? That's the highest percentage of any religious group. There's 7 billion people. 23% are Muslim. Do you know what the Jewish population is? 0.2%. Only 0.2%. In fact, it's estimated there are a hundred times more atheists than there are Jewish people in the world. So it's, 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 it's God's chosen people, but they're a very small, small minority. Thank you, Commissioner. We love you. Happy birthday. We love you. Don't you be in the day. All right. Shalom. Peace the day. Go to Disney World. No, you stay there. You got one more to what do. What should I do? You just, you know what? I'm going to let it run, so you just uh, hang out. Welcome. Well, we're going to play this. Okay. You can sing a better show over that night. Oh, well, okay. Look at this one. Okay. 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 Uh, singing Let It Go and when Pierre Webster in the house didn't uh, score me any brownie points. Oh, you guys are kidding. We didn't like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs>